on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, one of America's leading urban public libraries, delivering exceptional services and programs with a mission to improve lives and build a stronger community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. I think that almost all of my work is inspired in some way by identity and by questioning my own identity, but also kind of what identity is in a larger picture. I'm pretty interested in like, the idea of like, fluidity in identity and even more so the idea of masking and what it means when identity itself is a mask and there's no true self or true identity underneath all the masks of identity you know i think it's a i think it's pretty fascinating that you can be you can be whoever you want and you can if you decide that you want to be a different person tomorrow you just have to start acting like that different person that you want to be and then you're that person Amy Herman is a visual artist, business owner, and community builder. Her photography is in the permanent collections of several museums, including the Kresge Art Center in East Lansing and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, and has been shown in numerous galleries, including at the Light Factory and at Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte. Amy is the co-director of Goodyear Arts, an artist in residency and event space initiative, and owner of Vintage Charlotte, a pop-up market of vintage and handmade vendors. She is a recipient of the Charlotte Magazine 2015 Charlatan of the Year Award. In this episode, we explore her photography, the staging of intimate moments, what artists need, and creating community. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Amy, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. You are an artist, photographer, educator, change agent, <laughs> entrepreneur. How do you think of yourself? Hmm. Good good first question. <laughs> All of the above. I guess I guess primarily as an artist because I think artist encompasses everything you just said. Of course, I've I guess, more than dabbled in going down those paths a little further. But yeah, I, I think being an artist is about change and it is about being an entrepreneur and it is about education. So I guess an artist is what I would say. What makes an artist an artist? There are people who do art who are very self-conscious about calling themselves an artist? Hmm. I mean, there were, so there, there were kind of like two questions there, right? It's like, what makes an artist an artist? And then what makes me an artist? And I think that the first question, what makes an artist an artist, I think is probably self-defined for the most part. If you think you're an artist, then I guess you're an artist. I don't necessarily think that means you're a good artist, but I don't think that it's up to someone else to tell you if you're an artist or not. What makes me an artist, I think, is that I create visual work for no real reason other than I want to make this visual work. And I think that being an artist is a really selfish thing at its core because it's doing the thing Thing that you want to do more than anything and not really caring what other people think about you or your process or your final product. How do you see your role in the community? I don't know. 
like, what do you mean? What's my role in the community? I, I guess I, I think community is really important. I think especially cultivating a community for artists and like-minded people to have an outlet to discuss their work, others' work, see art, participate in art together is really important. I guess that some people would think, would say that I'm a leader in the community. It's not that I don't see myself as a leader in the community. I just am only trying to create the community that I want to be a part of. Do you see the work that you do in community as an extension of your art? No, I don't. I think it's important. I don't see community making as art. You don't? No. Why not? Probably because that's not my practice. I think that there are people who have an art practice that's community-based or social practice-based or place-making based and that they obviously consider that to be their art. But for me, truly my, my art practice is visual and I make a thing that I want to be seen. I just am, have always been a person who wants to be in a strong community. So no, I guess I don't really consider my community practices to be art. Let's talk about the visual work you have done. You had an art installation at Central Piedmont Community College. What was that work? There were two different bodies of work that were shown. One was entitled, It Wasn't Important Until It Was. That work is photographic work that's made through a staged installation of a 35 millimeter film projected slide and then re-photographing that. Sometimes it's on my body and sometimes it's projected onto the, at the time, the walls of my unfinished home. And then the other second part of that show was a series of 30 very tiny, in fact, the exact size of an iPhone 6 screen, photographs that were printed on plexiglass or rather under the plexiglass. And those were created on Snapchat. And those were created by doing a face swap with members of my immediate family over time. And that work was entitled A Part of Me. What inspired the work? I think that almost all of my work is inspired in some way by identity and by questioning my own identity, but also kind of what identity is in a larger picture. I'm pretty interested in like the idea of fluidity in identity and even more so the idea of masking and what it means when identity itself is a mask and there's no true self or true identity underneath all the masks of identity. You know, I think it's a, I think it's pretty fascinating that you can be, you can be whoever you want and you can, if you decide that you want to be a different person tomorrow, you just have to start acting like that different person that you want to be. And then you're that person. And I think that there's been sort of this change in the way that identity has been received through time. You know, it kind of like Freudian used to, it, that was like, find your true self, like know who the, in, the you is inside. And postmodern identity is sort of the opposite that like there actually is no one inside and that we're all just wearing these masks of like whoever it is that we think we might be or want to be or, or like have trained ourselves to be. And then I even think that maybe we've gone to like this one step further now, post postmodern, I don't know, where we're like exploring whether or not one of our masks can actually be absorbed into the true self in some way, which sounds so crazy, but I do think that there's, I think there's a lot of questions about, do you feel authentic to yourself? And that's such a that's such a crazy thing to even question because you're just a, you're just yourself. You can't. So I guess that's about, that's what the works 
stems from, I think, at the core is like is my kind of like questions about identity, both as my personal identity identity and also like group identity. If I was standing in front of the work, what would I see? Primarily my work is photography. It's photographs. The work it wasn't important until it was is pretty dark. There's a lot of blacks. There's a lot of negative space. Dark in color or dark in subject matter and theme? Dark in color, but almost all of my work is a little bit dark in theme too, I would say. A lot of it feels sort of nostalgic, almost in a sad way, and that's intentional. There's a lot of play with memory and questioning it wasn't important until it was had a lot of questions about our memories and whether our memories are accurate or even if that's important. And so I was actually using my parents' slides from before I was born, but using slides of things that had been described to me or shown to me so many times that I felt that I remembered them. And so there's sort of like a, in the, in the imagery, the way that that sort of becomes visual is sort of through this confusing way that the slides sort of shift from plane to plane because they're being projected on things that are often not flat. And so there's sort of like looking at memory through this distorted lens. And then the reason that I chose to project the work of these kind of like memories onto my house as it was being built is because I really wanted to explore this feeling of like, at like its cheesiest sense, like how does a house become a home? But at its kind of like more interesting level, how can you build memory into a house? How can you, how can you move across the country and keep something recognizable. I think about my, my parents recently moved across the country and their how their new house looks exactly the same as their old house. Like, you know, it has all the same furniture and I swear they picked the same paint colors and walking into that house, even though it's a new house, it's a different house. It feels like home because it has all the familiar things in it. And so I was thinking a lot about how can this brand new house that's being built and renovated have memory and feeling in it. What do you hope the viewer feels looking at your work? I don't know. I mean, I guess there's, there's what I hope. I don't like to say what I think the viewer should feel necessarily. I suppose I, in an ideal situation, they would feel a sense of memory and a sense of maybe something that feels familiar, but also fragmented, that they're not getting the whole story, but they feel that there is a story. When you take a photograph and display it, do you think about an audience? I think at a certain level, if a visual artist isn't thinking about the audience, why make visual work? But that being said, I wouldn't say that I'm thinking about a buyer or I'm thinking about, oh, whose house would this look great in? Or what museum would I love to have this piece in? I think visual art is meant to be seen. And if you're just making visual art to kind of shove it under your bed, then it's then maybe not it might not be art. Does an audience inform the choices you make? I don't think so. Though maybe it informs things like getting it printed and framed, you know, I, I, so I guess at the base level, it informs the way it's displayed. You know, you don't want it to be on a wall and have somebody knock into it and ruin the piece or, you know, so at that level, but I don't, I don't think an audience informs the actual visual elements. Do you produce art to be sold? No. And I'm not very good at selling art. (laughs) I mean, I wish I could say yes. You know, I wish I could say, 
yes, I produce art to be sold and I'm rich because of it, but I'm, but that's just not true. I mean, it, my work is actually like not super sellable because a lot of my work is pictures of my family. And quite frankly, most people think it's weird to have pictures of other people's family hanging in their homes. So no, I don't make work to be sold. There is a photography series on your website called Relative Intimacy. What is that series about? That was my thesis work in grad school. And that work is really about the relationships between family members and how those relationships change over time. So, for example, there's a photograph of me with my head on my mother's lap, and she is sort of stroking my hair. And that photograph was really made to show this sort of tender connection that a mother has to a daughter. And then I wanted to also make a photograph in which my hands were in my mother's hair to show the way that as a mother ages, it then becomes the daughter's responsibility to care for the mother and those roles sort of become inverted. And so there's a photograph of me putting hair dye into my mother's hair. Also a very tender and intimate moment. So I play with these shifts in sort of family identity, family relationships in that work. And one of my kind of like, one of the photographs is based on this time that my dad and I went to a restaurant where my mom and him had frequented. And the waitress kind of looked at me and looked at him and asked how his wife was in front of me, thinking that I was the other woman. And it was such a bizarre moment. My dad kind of like looked at me and laughed and said, you know, that's just so weird. And so then I made a photograph based on that experience. We went to the corner bar and we sat together and I kind of costumed myself a little bit to look a little older and my dad to look a little younger. And when we're sitting next to each other at this bar, you would never, you don't know what the relationship is between two people. And I kind of love that when you look at a photograph, you're making all these assumptions and then maybe you read the title and we're wrong, or maybe you read the title and we're right. Or maybe you don't read the title at all and you never know. Does it matter that photographs of intimacy are staged? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that's so right. There's a way to take photographs of intimacy that isn't staged. But my practice is almost exclusively staging photographs. I think that I'm I'm not I I am interested in the real emotion and the real you know, in, I am at my core, very interested in the relationship that I have with my mother, but that's not what I'm trying to show. I'm not showing my relationship with my mother. I'm showing relationships with mothers. So in a certain way, it doesn't matter if it's real because I'm not showing my real relationship with my mother, though some of the experience are experiences that I show or some of the photographs that I make are based on real experiences, some are not. Some are also, oh, I think it would be really weird if my dad and I were both watching a movie on my on a laptop together. That has never happened in my life, but I made a photograph of it because I thought it would be weird. And it and it was. I think that there is a way to show quote unquote real intimacy. I mean don't let's not use the word real in photography at all because nothing's real, right? But that's not my, my practice is not to show the, the, like, you can't show real emotion. You know, you can't show like, you, there's no real moment in that can be captured by a camera because no matter what, it's been framed in some way, right? The photographer took a picture of just one portion of a larger moment that was happening. And so we don't know what was happening off screen. Is this person crying because they stubbed their toe or because of what we're seeing. 
I think there's a sliding scale of things that are more documentary and less documentary, but I think that true, like a true document in photography does not exist. Actually, I think your photograph is postmodern to the extent that it asks the question whether all moments of, of intimacy are staged. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, yeah, it's not, that's, I don't think that that's untrue. In addition to your work as a photographer, you also have done this work in community building and bringing artists together. So Skyline Artists in Residence is a residency program that was started in 2015 by Amy Bagwell, Graham Carew, and myself. We were given the opportunity to use a then defunct Goodyear tire building and we were given a small amount of money to give to the artists that we selected to be in residence in that building. That building in particular was a tire center and it was very dirty. It was very grimy. It was very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. It had a lot of quirks. The artists rose to the occasion and we had 12 artists in residence at that building. The residencies at that very beginning were one month long, so it was very fast and furious. The idea behind the residency program has always been just that artists need space, time, money, and community. And those four words came from a a, a speech that I gave to (laughs) a room full of real estate developers in a sort of tongue-in-cheek way where they wanted me to talk about how great Charlotte was and how there's so much going on for the creative community. And instead, I told them that what we really needed was everything that they had. And surprisingly, it turned into them offering three artists the opportunity to use the building that I gave the speech in. So it turned into something really cool. And, you know, we, when we started that project, we thought that it would last only the three months that we were offered the building. We're now going into our third year of residencies. We've also had three locations. This is our third location. What have you learned through each iteration of Goodyear Arts? A lot. (laughs) You know, I think at the beginning, the thing that we learned that we maybe already knew or maybe had an inkling, which is why Goodyear works at all, was that everybody wants the same thing in terms of having a thriving arts community in Charlotte. There's nobody who doesn't want that. So when you offer corporations the opportunity to, at a very low dollar amount, get involved with something that could actually be impactful, they did. So our first year was entirely corporate sponsors. And so I think that's what we learned the first time around. And then we learned that other developers also thought this was cool. And so we were before we even closed the doors on our first building, we had an offer for a second building, which is incredible. Thinking about it is incredible because it is basically a developer saying, I see what you're doing and I like it. And I have this building that I'm going to entrust to you. And that's how we ended up at our second building. And You know, I think maybe what we've learned is just that if you're really trying to do something because you believe in it and because it's what you would want as a person who lives in a city, that other people will also want it. You know, we're not doing this because we want to run an arts nonprofit because we don't. You know, it sucks. It's like the worst, right? You're like constantly like, oh, where's the money going to be? And I don't get paid for doing this. And just all these challenges. And 
But, but what we do want and believe in enough to continue doing the work that we're doing is this arts community and this space to be in where it feels like it's a safe spot to make challenging work and show challenging work and encounter challenging work. And, you know, I have been told by a lot of people like, oh, there's nowhere else in town that this particular work could be shown. And it's just so fascinating that, you know, why? Why? Like, that's not right. But it's because we don't have any, you know, we don't, we're not, our our only financial sponsor is Knight Foundation and Knight Foundation above everything else is looking for artistic excellency and which is the same thing that Goodyear Arts is looking for. And so we don't have to worry about upsetting anybody. If we want to show something, if we want to have host an art show about what it means to be American and have several different iterations of anti-Trump and anti-American art on the walls, we can do whatever we want because we have no, there's no one that's going to get upset by that. And that's the real freedom is that we can just do whatever we want, which in like, it sounds crazy, but you know, we have structure and we have a board, but our board members support our main function is to just support excellent art. What criteria do you use to select your artist residents? The first two years, it's the first two terms, I'll say, not necessarily years, the artists were selected very fast and furious. We only had about a month to plan each one of those two iterations. And artistic excellency above all other things, but there is a certain puzzle to put together as well because we are talking about a two-month residency that culminates in a showcase in which the three artists will be showing their work together, you have to think about what that show will look like. You don't want three painters that paint zebras in the same show, or maybe you do, but you have to think about those things. And artist availability also was a huge factor, especially when we only had one month to plan. It's kind of you're in or you're out, and if you're not available, you know, we can't make you available. And so... We definitely uh, branched out this in this third year of residencies. This year, we had a little bit more runway. And so we were able to do an open call. And that open call was juried by members of the Charlotte Arts community. And they, that's how these were selected. Does the character or personality of the artist matter? Yes. Being in a space with somebody and we're this community that we're creating this this collective that it's turned into that we never foresaw at the beginning you can't have somebody in there that you don't trust and i say that very loosely i'm not saying you know an artist who's a who's like a bad person you know i don't want to be around somebody who is not a good person but i think that there's there's more to it there's are they a team player? Will they want to clean the bathroom when they, if, if they are interested in being in the collective? You know, we have no funding to pay for a janitor. So the building is being maintained by the artists. You know, if, if you are a high maintenance artist and you know that about yourself, you're probably not going to apply for a residency in a place where there's no heat well, very little heat and no air conditioning and the roof leaks and and it's gritty, but that's also what makes it so great. Does limiting who gets residencies to likable people limit the production of what might otherwise be great and daring art? Probably. And just because somebody doesn't have a residency at Goodyear Arts doesn't mean that we don't show their art because only three shows a year are determined by the residencies, and those are the residency showcases. Otherwise, we're showing primarily non-Goodyear art artists. So I would hate for it to seem that we're not only limiting 
the residencies, but we're limiting because we're not limiting what's being shown. And we're really open to showing just about anything. Amy, what is Vintage Charlotte? <laughs> Ooh, let's just go over here now. <laughs> Vintage Charlotte is my company. I started it, we're going into the seventh year of events. We throw retail events. So two very large markets a year, which include handmade and vintage vendors, both local and regional. And then we do a pop-up shop uh, around Christmas in Uptown. Is Vintage Charlotte, both in what it displays and in its pop-up nature, another form of the preservation and resurrection of moments of time? I have never thought about Vintage Charlotte in that way. Isn't it an extension of the same themes that you're exploring in your photography? Maybe. I don't think about Vintage Charlotte as art. It is, I think, a very well-executed event, but I don't think that it's art. So to talk about it in the way that I talk about my art is difficult. I think, yes, there is a temporal nature to the event. Yes. I'm interested in time, (laughs) but I think that's kind of like as far as I'd go trying to draw similarities between themes. Really? Yeah. You don't see it? I mean, I, 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 I could see it, but I think that only one body of work feels like it includes something vintage and that All photography is about time, and most of my work has probably a little bit more time in it, and maybe time shifts, but I think only my projection images, I would say, do I feel include kind of history and vintage and memory. Is the administrative work that you're doing coming at the cost of your art? Yes. Yes. And I think about that a lot. I think it's really hard to find a balance between trying to create this community and this change and this money that you need and making the art that you also need. And I think I'm getting better at the balance, but I definitely think that I make less art because I do these other things. Amy, what do you want? I guess I just want the same things that I, that Goodyear Arts is trying to provide for artists, which is that time, space, money, and community. That Goodyear Arts would be fully funded in a way that I don't actually have to work anymore, but that's so unrealistic because it's, that's, that's basically saying, you know, pay me for this idea and then have other people do the work, which is, like the complete opposite of everything that I believe in. Do you think artists should get paid? Yes. Do you think you should get paid for your art? Yes. I just think that all artists should be paid for their art. And I think that artists should be paid for their time that they spend making art. But I think it becomes a very complicated challenge of capitalism. And that is, you know, that's not a... That's not like a, oh, here, I'm going to wave my magic wand and capitalism no longer exists and people don't have to work for money anymore. So I think that it's just a really, it's not, it's not something that's going to be solved today or tomorrow or probably maybe ever. I noticed everything you do gets extensive coverage in Charlotte Magazine. Artists who have been in Charlotte for years get often very little press. What's up with you and Charlotte Magazine? I think that Goodyear Arts is very, very fortunate to have a friend in journalist Andy Smith and that he caught on to what we were doing at Skyline Artists in Residence and felt that the work was very important and impactful and wrote an initial story that covered just the basics, what we were doing, which at the end of the year turned into the three co-directors being awarded Charlatina of the Year, which we 
did not expect and were very shocked about. That coverage has continued through our buildings until now. I think because what we're doing is important. And I hope that that's why the coverage has continued. And yes, we are friends with Andy, but I certainly hope that he would never cover something just because we're friends. And that at the basis of the articles, he thinks that the work we're doing is important. Everything you touch is covered by Charlotte Magazine. I send out really great press releases. (laughs) I do. (laughs) I mean, I spend a lot of time marketing my events because that's what makes them successful is marketing them. Amy, you grew up in Detroit. Where in Detroit? It's outside of Detroit and it's in a suburb called West Bloomfield. And what was your experience in West Bloomfield growing up? West Bloomfield is a very affluent neighborhood. It is somewhat racially diverse in that there are primarily Jews and Chaldeans. I am Jewish. I was raised Jewish. But both of these groups of people had a lot of money. And so it wasn't, it was maybe racially diverse, but definitely not financially diverse. How do you think of Detroit? I think of Detroit in a really positive way now. I think that when I was growing up there, we would go to concerts in downtown Detroit and our parents would tell us not to stop at red lights because it was unsafe for us to be there. And so that is how I was raised to know Detroit. The pictures that you've seen don't even capture the wasteland that it that Detroit really was. It driving through neighborhoods, and this was this is not now, this was kind of before the rejuvenation happened or started anyway. You would drive through neighborhoods and every other house would be burnt down or boarded up. And there were empty fields in the middle of what used to be really beautiful neighborhoods. And just car plants that were just empty. And, you know, luckily now there seems to be a resurgence in the arts in Detroit. I'm very far removed from that. I haven't lived in Michigan for over 15 years. But I see what some of my friends, especially my friends from undergrad who still live in Detroit, are doing in it seems like there's a lot of really interesting things happening there. And when I go back to Detroit now, I feel sort of a sense that things are growing and happening and really exciting. Did growing up in Detroit inform your work as an artist? Probably. I think everything informs your work as an artist, whether you, whether it's, you know, right in there blatantly, or if it's somewhere under the surface, it's probably in there. You know, I can tell you that living in the suburbs definitely influenced my work. So much of my work is about my parents' homes and that sort of middle, upper class suburban home. It appears in all of my work. And so that's definitely in there. Tell me about mom and dad. (laughs) I have the best mom and dad. The very best. My mom and dad, are like they could not be more supportive if they tried. And they, you know, I, I say to them, hey, I want to make this photograph of all of us laying in the king-size bed with my brother. And they're like, okay, I don't know. It sounds weird, but let's do it, you know? And it's like, And that's it. And it's just, they just will do whatever I ask and not question it and be there for me unconditionally. And they both have an interest in the arts. My dad was a photographer and a filmmaker and my mom was an interior designer, but she also has a deep interest in the arts and is still involved in the arts through being a docent at museums today. It was never hard for me to say, I'm going to be an artist or support me. I'm an artist because they knew that and they already did. Your dad is a photographer and filmmaker? He would say was. 
What influence was his work on you growing up? I mean, I can remember flipping through my dad's black and white photographs at a very early age. And I remember in my first photography class, you know, I didn't have to buy a camera because my dad was, oh, here's, use ours. And I remember him helping me very early on learning how to use a 35 millimeter camera. And even my mom actually shot with a 35 millimeter camera quite often. And my parents never took us to get those like cheesy portraits taken at the mall. They just took really great portraits of us. So I, you know, I think it's definitely all in there. Mm -hmm. What was important to you when you were young? How young? (laughs) Music and my friends and my family and playing outside and having an imagination. How about in high school? music and my friends and my family and not getting bullied. Are you the person today you expected to be when you were younger? Probably not. I don't know who I expected to be. I remember wanting to be a paleontologist. Um, I had like a huge rock collection and I can remember wanting to be an English teacher And I'm sure that somewhere in there, I wanted to be a photographer, but I don't remember wanting that. I remember wanting to be a paleontologist, for sure. (laughs) You went to Michigan State University. What did you study? I studied studio art. I got my BFA with a concentration in photography and a sub-concentration in ceramics and printmaking. And then you earned your MFA. Yes, at Columbia College, and that was in photography. An MFA in photography usually studies history and theory and and technique and image making. Do you think of yourself as an image maker? Yes, absolutely. Is there a school or theory of photography that guides your work? I don't know that there's a name for the type of work that I look at the most, but There certainly is a type of work, like a genre. I would say it's other people who are staging photographs of their family and really exploring identity. Is there a photographer whose work you particularly admire? I love the work that Larry Salton did. It's it's him photographing his parents. And in the book, there's an essay in which he, the photographer, is talking to his dad. And his dad is basically saying, well, these aren't pictures of me and these aren't pictures of my life. These are just what you see as me or my life. And it's a really interesting conversation about kind of this staged, you know, we were talking about the staged intimate moments and That's kind of what the conversation is about, but it's also about his dad just thinking he's like being kind of ridiculous, you know, and it's, that's, it's, it's a really meaningful essay. The the book is called Pictures from Home. Do you hope to have a book of your own one day? Maybe. I've never, well, I wouldn't say never, but I, I guess I don't necessarily think of my work in book form. I think there are a lot of photographers who do, and there are a lot of photographers whose goal is to end a project with a book. And I think that it would be great to make a book one day. And I'm very interested in photo books, but I wouldn't say that I make the work for a book. What's next for you? Well, I'm starting, I've recently started a new photo series. I am sort of exploring magic. I'm I'm really interested in this sort of magic as a visual trope. So like this way that Harry Potter sort of looks and how in pop culture magic has a look. I'm really interested in like why does it look that way and why is it that, you know, when you see a certain looking tree that it brings to mind magic 
And I'm just starting the work and it's going slow and steady, but it'll be interesting to see what I discover. Amy, when you are old and gray, what's the life you want to look back on? A life that is well-traveled and full of love and a life where I remembered to not sweat the small stuff and, you know, just having as many experiences as possible. Thanks for your time today. Yeah, thank you. Amy Herman is a visual artist, co-director of Goodyear Arts, and owner of Vintage Charlotte. She earned a BFA in Fine Arts from Michigan State University and an MFA in Photography from Columbia College, Chicago. And now, a personal word. Before my conversation with Amy, I looked at the photographs she created that had been exhibited at the Ross Gallery at Central Piedmont Community College and was now available for view on her personal artist website. I was immediately drawn in. Her work explores themes of identity and memory that I closely identify with and are at the heart of a course I teach on well-being and a life well-led. My own journey in life has been one of identity shifting and the archiving of time. I have recreated myself more than once, pursued many interests at once, and have documented the journey. First, some thoughts about Amy's work. Her series called A Part of Me is a collection of photographs that Amy took of herself in which she used a Snapchat feature called Face Swap. Amy employed the feature to swap faces with old photographs of family members, creating various versions of Amy that are strange and compelling. These photographs ask, who exactly are we? Who might we be? What are the many possibilities within us? Her exhibit called, It Wasn't Important Until It Was, are photographs she took of staged moments with her family that she projected onto the walls of a new home under renovation and photographed again. Her photographs of photographs ask, what exactly is real? What do we choose to remember? How is the memory of something different than the experience of living it? How does memory inform the life we value? I love the images Amy took and the questions inherent in the images. The images are weird, disquieting, very meta and postmodern. I thought of Jean-Paul Sartre's novel Nausea, where the main character, Antoine Roquentin, stares at a stone and has this odd feeling about existence. The stone as he knew it disappears, and he begins to see through it. He senses that nothing is real in itself, but everything is simply the meaning we give it. Amy's photographs compel us to see through them, to see that nothing is fixed, that reality is fluid. Sartre would say that existence precedes essence. He meant that individuals have no inherent identity, but create identity by how they act and project themselves. We might say we can be today whoever we want to be. Amy embodies her photographs. She shifts her identity by projecting different versions of herself. Artist, business owner, facilitator, director, advocate. She is all these projections at once. Layered, fractal, fragmented, whole. We all have many identities within us. So I have approached my life in the same way. Student, lawyer, novelist, business owner, essayist, editor, publisher, professor, podcaster. And like Amy, I have taken my share of photographs. I have taken thousands of images that I have printed. Since my first year in college, I have arranged photographs into carefully curated albums. It is a ritual for me. Once in spring and once in fall, I will take hours to document memory. I carefully sequence and position favorite photographs of adventures my wife and daughter have taken, of the people that matter to us, of the places we've seen. We can go back to those moments at any time, and we do, turning the pages of the albums, reminding ourselves of how strange and odd and weird and lovely life is. In his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, the economist Daniel Kahneman talks about our experiencing self and our remembering self. 
Our experiencing self operates in the present moment. The experiencing mind is fast, emotive, unconscious. It senses moments intuitively as events happen. Our remembering self operates in retrospect. The remembering mind is slow, rational, and conscious. It tells a story about what happened. The story I tell is what gives life meaning. A good life is one in which we are fulfilled in our life and satisfied about our life. Being intentional about how we live and remember our life is an artistic act. There is another element to Amy's work that I closely identify with, which is the creation of community. Her motivation is to create the community she wants to live in, and, so in large measure, is mine. She wants to live in a city that values artists like her and provides what artists like her need. I want to live in a city that values the humanities in its fullest sense, one with the mindful and physical design that allows all citizens to thrive. So thanks for the good work, Amy. In turning your lens on identity and memory, you reveal the possibilities of who and what we might be. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.